This is the Capital Rundown. What you had was basically the Democrats ran the table against the Republicans, not only in the state legislature, where the first time in 40 years, the D's now have control of not only the Senate, but the Michigan House. But best of all, we get to keep doing this work, serving the public in our beautiful home state. It's all straight ahead. The Capitol Rundown starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lauren Thompson. The midterm elections have come and gone, and while many predicted a red wave to sweep the country, it was blue that swept the ticket here in Michigan, even making history all the way to our state capitol. Governor Gretchen Whitmer will again lead the Democrats in our state's top spot for the next four years. She defeated her opponent, Tudor Dixon, by double digits, taking 54% of the vote compared to Tudor Dixon's 44%. Wednesday, the governor declared victory, thanking her supporters and the voters and laying out some of her plans for the next four years. But best of all, we get to keep doing this work, serving the public in our beautiful home state. People have reaffirmed that fun focusing on the fundamentals, building a Michigan where every person can get ahead is what really matters right now more than ever. We will continue growing our economy by competing for projects to make more cars, semiconductors, and clean energy here in Michigan. We will protect the Great Lakes for generations and ensure that every Michigander can pursue their potential from preschool to post-secondary. And we'll keep fighting like hell to protect fundamental rights. Well, after she called the governor, Tudor Dixon took to Twitter for her concession in the race. Wednesday, she tweeted in part, Michigan's future success rests not in elected officials of government, but all of us. It's incumbent upon all of us to help our children read, support law enforcement, and grow our economy. She went on to thank her supporters, saying, quote, we came up short, but we will never stop fighting for our families. And that wasn't the last we heard from Dixon this week. Thursday night, she took to Twitter again, posting what appeared to be a memo from the Michigan GOP, blaming her for the poor performance of the Republican Party as a whole across the state. Dixon responded, tweeting, this is the perfect example of what is wrong with the Michigan GOP. It's an issue of leadership. In a follow-up tweet, she said the party fought against her every step of the way. So what does this show about the state of the Michigan Republican Party and the division among it? We asked our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik to weigh in. The finger pointing has begun. In fact, it took a little longer than I thought. Uh, this was all triggered by the gentleman who is the chief of staff of the Michigan Republican Party, who fired off a memo basically blaming all of the losses that we just talked about earlier about the Democrats running the table on Tudor Dixon's campaign or lack of same. Ms. Dixon uh, took umbrage to that, of course. Uh, she actually, you know, got more votes than Bill Schuette did four years ago, but she basically ran a campaign that was never going to be much of a winner because she never had the independent voters that she needed. And the Republican vice, excuse me, the Republican chief of staff pointed that out, basically said because she ran such a lousy campaign, the Republicans did take a bath and they're pointing the finger at her and she's pointing the finger at them and the Democrats are going, we like this. Well, there's going to be a frantic search for the heart and soul of this, this party. The question is unanswered at this read, does Donald Trump continue to hold a stranglehold on the Michigan Republican Party. Not in his favor. All of the candidates that he endorsed at the top of the ticket, and he was there for all of them, the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, and the gubernatorial candidates, all three of them lost. Not exactly a record that speaks well for Mr. Trump in the state of Michigan. So the question is, if there's going to be a challenge to his uh, basically unelected chairmanship of the Michigan Republican Party, who in the heck is going to do that, or what people will do that, to take on Donald Trump to get his grip a vice grip that he has in the Michigan Republican Party and to loosen that grip so that the party can reinvent itself to maybe win some next elections rather than lose as bad as they did on Tuesday. It could be a civil war that will be interesting to watch. All right, thanks, Tim. And we will check back in with Skubik for his take on the election itself later in the show. Well, another top Democrat staying in office is Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. She beat her challenger, Christina Caramo, earning nearly 56% of the vote. She declared victory Tuesday night, saying it was a win for democracy across our state. The race for Michigan Attorney General was expected to be one of the closest on the ballot, but current AG Dana Nessel will be the state's top attorney once again. She beat Republican Matt DiPerno with 53% of the vote compared to his 44%. 
Well, for the first time in nearly 40 years, Democrats are taking control of both chambers of the Michigan legislature. The state house hasn't been under Democratic control since 2010. The state Senate has been controlled by Republicans since the 1980s. Many were surprised Wednesday morning to see Democrats with 56 votes, giving the Republicans the minority status for the first time in some 40 years. It's a historic switch, one that will bring in the state's first African-American speaker of the Michigan House, Representative Joe Tate, who's from Detroit. The changing of the guard will likely mean the governor will have an easier time passing her agenda without hitting major roadblocks from Republicans. And Michigan has also named its first woman to be Senate Majority Leader. Grand Rapids Senator Winnie Brinks will be the first woman Senate Majority Leader in Michigan history for this 102nd legislature. Brinks released a statement this week saying she's honored to have been elected by her peers to lead the first Democratic majority in the Michigan Senate since 1983, and that with 12 women and 8 men, the Senate Democrats make up a dynamic, diverse caucus. She added that Democrats will focus on creating good paying jobs, safer work environments, making health care more affordable and available, and ensuring quality education for all. Well, it was certainly a Michigan midterm for those record books. And after the break, our Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik comes back and joins us. He was watching it and analyzing it every second of the way, and he'll share more thoughts with us when the Capitol Rundown returns. Welcome back. It certainly was a historic week in Michigan politics, and nobody watched it closer than our Capitol correspondent, Tim Skubik. He's here for you now to share his thoughts on the results. All right, Tim, thank you so much for joining us as always. So it was a busy week here in Michigan for the Democrats and the Republicans. But what do you think about the results from this week's midterm election? <laughs> Where to begin to unpack this story? I mean, this is historic. It is incredible. Uh, it was partially unexpected. What you had was basically the Democrats ran the table against the Republicans, not only in the state legislature, where the first time in 40 years, the D's now have control of not only the Senate, but the Michigan House, but starting at the top of the ballot with Gretchen Whitmer, going right through to Jocelyn Benson, Secretary of State, Attorney General Dana Nessel, and then virtually every statewide office below that, including eight seats on the education boards, all went to the D's. In other words, the Republicans took a bath. They basically were not in the game and they were stunned by this. They expected to do much better and they didn't. And as a result, the D's took advantage of the abortion issue, which turns out in the final analysis to have been the driver to get more Democrats to the polls to vote for proposal three and then hang around long enough to vote for all those Democrats on the ballot. The one Republican who survived this tsunami was uh, Mr. Zara, the justice on the state Supreme Court. He's nonpartisan, but everybody knows he's a Republican. And the only reason he won, he had after his name, justice of the state Supreme Court, which is just worth its weight in gold. So the Republicans are licking their wounds. And the question is, what does the next Republican Party look like since this old one didn't look so hot? When I went to bed, and I can't even remember when that was, <laughs> uh, bed, what a wonderful thing. I, uh, I, 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 I was pretty sure that Gretchen Whitmer was going to be governor. And I was maybe a little less sure, but willing to put some money on the fact that I thought the D's would take the Senate. But in my wildest imagination, and I didn't have that dream that night, that the Democrats would take control of the Michigan House. Now, one caveat here. The Democrats have a one-vote margin of control in the House and a one-vote margin control of the Senate. That is very, very tenuous. And while the governor will be happy that she has control of the legislature, this doesn't mean that she gets everything that she wants. Remember, Democrats are Democrats. They sometimes disagree amongst themselves. If they didn't, they'd be Republicans. And here's what could happen. If you got a one vote edge in the House and the Senate, that means that any one lawmaker can upset the apple cart and go to the governor and say, Governor, you know, I know you need my vote. And well, how about if you give me X, Y, and Z? So in other words, the governor is not getting a lock on her agenda, but she certainly got a shot at it. But she's going to have to work with some Republicans along the way to get her agenda passed. All right, we have a lot to keep our eyes on, Tim. And as always, thank you so much for joining us. Up next, all eyes were on the congressional race in Michigan's 7th Congressional District ahead of Election Day. We'll take a look at that outcome when the Capitol Rundown returns.
race in Michigan's newly drawn 7th Congressional District was an intense one. That's where current Democratic Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin faced a challenge from well-known state senator Republican Tom Barrett. Barrett had a lead in the polls for the majority of election night, but in the end, Slotkin held on to her spot, earning nearly 52% of the vote. She even beat Barrett on his home turf, winning by two points in Eaton County. It was an expensive victory and loss. More than $35 million was spent campaigning on this race alone. Wednesday, Slotkin reflected on the race and shared some details about the concession call she got from Tom Barrett. Our margin is going to be over five percentage points, so more than 20,000 votes. That's the biggest margin of victory we've ever had. This is tough turf for a Democrat. And that means there is no way to win this race without building a very broad coalition of Democrats, independents, and Republicans. It was a tough race for both of us, and I appreciated that he called, you know, um, and, and thanked him for that. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see each other in the next weeks and months around the Lansing area. It was very respectful. The seventh congressional race garnered national attention as it was thought to be at the center of the battle for the balance of power between Democrats and Republicans in D.C. Well, Michigan's 5th Congressional District stretches clear across the bottom portion of our state, and that's where Republican Congressman Tim Wahlberg won a re-election this year. Wahlberg had a big win over challenger Democrat Bart Goldberg, earning more than 62% of the vote. On election night, Wahlberg said he's looking forward to a new term with some new territory. This is an unusual district for me. I've never represented a, a truly conservative Republican district. And that's what this is, Add, adding the west part of the state uh, to uh, counties like Hillsdale and Branch, adds St. Joe and Cass and Berrien. It's, it really makes it a solid conservative district. The big name election races took center stage, but Michigan voters also made decisions on multiple proposals, including abortion rights. Up next, we'll take a look at the results of those ballot issues and what it means for Michiganders going forward. Stay with us. Welcome back. All three proposals on the ballot passed on Tuesday, and Proposal 3 itself was the most controversial. It focused on reproductive rights, and more specifically, as the right to an abortion and contraceptive use to our state's constitution. Let's take a look at those results. The proposal passed with 57% of the vote, meaning the right to an abortion will be added to the Michigan Constitution. In addition, it allows individuals in Michigan to make their own decisions regarding pregnancy, prenatal care, childbirth, and postpartum care. It's about the people that this will impact, the barriers that we can break down. It's about the people in Michigan that are going to have access to the care that they need and those from other states who are living in abortion deserts who now can come to or can continue to come to Michigan. First of all, we would just want to say thank you to all of our affiliate members and all of the volunteers that worked really hard to try to defeat this. Um, obviously, we're going to keep going to fight. Um, you know, this radical agenda in Michigan. Well, voters also said yes to Proposal 1. This changes the term limits for state lawmakers and adds some transparency requirements. This proposal passed with 66% of the vote. It means that lawmakers will now be limited to 12 years maximum in office, but can serve it in any combination in the House and Senate. In addition, the Governor, Attorney General, and Secretary of State will now be required to disclose financial information. Proposal 2 passed as well. It primarily focuses on making it easier for people to vote. 60% of people voted in agreement, while 40% said no. This now legalizes early voting, requires mandatory ballot drop-off boxes in every city, and amends Michigan's constitution to allow nine days of early in-person voting. Voters will also be allowed to use a signature for identification instead of a picture ID. Well, up next here on the Capitol Rundown, the power struggle this midterm election didn't just happen here in Michigan. We'll head to Washington, D.C. for the latest on the battle for control of our nation's capital when we come right back. The future of the balance of power in Washington still remains to be seen as control of the House and Senate are still up for grabs. Natalie Brand is here for you with the latest. Election workers continue to count ballots in some of the nation's closest races. Over, and we don't know the exact numbers, 
but over about 400,000 votes yet to be counted and reported. Democrats are touting a better than expected election night. President Biden made calls to some of the winners and those he campaigned for. That includes John Fetterman. CBS News projects he won Pennsylvania's Senate race in a Democratic pickup. But other key Senate races are still considered toss-ups, including Nevada and Georgia. Election officials in the Peach State say that race will be decided in a December 6th runoff. Ballots are being built as we speak and counties are making preparations. CBS News projects Senate Republican Ron Johnson will hold on to his seat in Wisconsin. The Arizona Senate race leans Democratic with votes still being counted. CBS News projects the U.S. House is leaning Republican with some of the most competitive races not yet called. We will be in the majority and Nancy Pelosi will be in the minority. Yeah. Republicans were expecting a red wave, but that did not materialize and GOP candidates backed by former President Trump had mixed results. Quite honestly, people are tired and exhausted from all of the baggage and, and kind of the cloud the, that surrounds uh, any type of Trump campaign. Exit polling revealed Trump mattered more to those voting for Democrats. More than half of Democrats said their vote was to oppose him. He's hinted at announcing a 2024 run next week. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Well, the midterm election was historic for many reasons, and here's another. Next year, a record 12 women will serve as governors of states across the country. The previous record was nine and set back in 2004. This week, incumbent governors who are women won re-election here in Michigan, of course, and in Alabama, Iowa, Kansas, Maine, New Mexico, and South Dakota. Voters in Massachusetts, Arkansas, Arizona, and Oregon also elected women to lead their state. New York Governor Kathy Hochul won a first full term after taking over last year when Andrew Cuomo resigned. In all, 25 women were nominated for governor by Democrats and Republicans this year. Well, if you're interested in getting more political news for Michigan and Washington, we have just the thing for you. You can sign up for our Capital Rundown newsletter. It's just one email each week, and you can get it by pointing your cell phone camera at the screen right now. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching the Capital Rundown. We hope to see you again next weekend.